y'all can move on down so there's space for everybody. It's just gonna be dead quiet in there, but I mean, there's actually people up and moving around. I mean, it's quiet still, but yeah, but I mean, it's, that was cool. Hey, folks. So, um, I would like to introduce you to Royce Renfrew, he's one of our flight directors, and um, I'm gonna let him tell you some of his stories and tell you about the room we're in and that sort of thing, make yourselves comfortable. One of the things I do want to recommend is you don't use a flash because it'll, <laughs> it'll bounce off the windows. Thank you. Appreciate you. You're welcome. Okay, welcome. I, I'm, I hope everybody's been having a good time today. So, two groups that happen to co coincide here today say hi to a bunch of University of Illinois engineering students. Uh, hi. These are a bunch of NASA uh, social folks that, that spend a lot of time using social media. Got selected to come out here and do the career of NASA. So, everybody has to do all right, so what can we see looking in here? This is the, the uh, International Space Station Flight Control Room for the uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. The video that you see up on the board there is all live. Uh, the crew today is spending some time bopping back and forth, packing the Dragon vehicle to turn back to the Dragon Center on Monday. They're getting that all ready to go, getting that put away, strapped in, ready to come home. Every now and again, you'll see crew members popping across there and uh, uh, carrying bags and back and forth and whatnot. And then uh, coming up next week, also, we'll launch uh, another Soyuz vehicle from Baikonur that will bring up three more crew members and we'll get back up to a crew complement of six, which is where we normally exist. Right now, you've got three folks on the vehicle. There's a Canadian astronaut, Chris Hadfield, for all you social media fanatics. I'm assuming everybody already follows <laughs> Commander Hadfield. <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, Tom, Mosh Tom Marshburn and, and Roman is uh, uh, our Russian crew member that's on the vehicle right now. Some of the stuff you can see up on the big board there, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll start my stopwatch here. You can see that. Uh, the ISS is currently just south of uh, Alaska, and then I'm going to talk to you all for a little while, and we'll look uh, and see how long it's traveled in, say, 15 minutes. It's traveling at 17 and a half thousand miles an hour. That's about five miles a minute. Uh, it could run the Daytona 500. It could run 37 of them, I think I calculated, in an hour uh, uh, if it needed to. <coughs> the, the other stuff you can see on the big board there all these little blobs and circles and knobs and dials and whatnot. So first of all, they, if you follow the track of the ISS, it's going on some little white sinus photo lines that go across the world there. If you think about the orbit of the vehicle, it's actually going circular. So it's going around the Earth at 17 and a half thousand miles an hour in a circle, but the Earth itself is turning underneath it. So the ground track, which is represented by the white lines you can see on there, moves to the east every orbit. So in, in a full day's time, the ISS will have covered essentially the entire uh, ground mass of the Earth that uh, goes around uh, 15 and a half times a day or 16 orbits a day. The other thing that you get out of the fact that it's going that fast is going around the world every 90 minutes is that you get into a config where you have uh, day, uh, sunrise and sunsets every orbit. So right now, if on the ISS, if they were looking out the window, it's just coming out of the dark side. So you can see the dark and light shading on the big board there. So it's coming out of an orbital night into an orbital day, so that's a sunrise. 
in about 45 minutes from now, it'll, it'll transition into a night pass over Africa there, just south of Africa. And that'll be uh, one day, one sunrise, one sunset, and then we do that uh, every orbit. It also happens to be, if you look on the board there, the, the, it looks like the lines are pretty straight up and down for the night passes and the day passes because we're almost at the equinox. We'll get to the equinox. I think the 21st is the equinox, and those lines will be straight up and down. Uh, we get into configs sometimes on the vehicle where we are, where the night passes are really short and the day passes are really long. But the crew who lives inside of a, a, a big tin can don't really notice the night passes or the day passes unless they happen to be looking out of a window. Uh, they're all they're all living in a laboratory, so the lights are on and that's daytime. Um, and some of the other stuff you can see on there, if you look, there's a little uh, SpaceX KSC dot, right, where Kennedy Space Center would be in Florida. That's a ground site that the SpaceX guys are using, the folks in uh, 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 Hawthorne out at SpaceX. The control center actually, when we're docked like this, is at KSC. There's a ground site that allows line of sight communication between the vehicle and that ground site. There's another one up in Newfoundland that has line of sight uh, communication with the vehicle. So whenever the vehicle, which is represented by that uh, white oval that's around the ISS, whenever that white oval intersects with that blue oval, there's line of sight communication you can talk directly to the vehicle. Uh, we don't normally talk directly to the vehicle with ground sites for the ISS daily ops. What we normally do use is a series of uh, TDRS satellites uh, tracking data relay system satellites or TDRS. There are three of them that we normally use. You can see one almost over on the left-hand side of the board that says T-47 West. Then there's one just off the coast of, uh, of uh, Brazil there. And then there's another one just south of India, the T-275 West. Uh, the way that works is there are antennas on the ISS, there are antennas on the satellite. So we ship data from the ISS up to that satellite, and then that satellite turns it around and ships it back to a ground site somewhere, somewhere in the world, and then that gets shipped via various communication cables back over here to these consoles. So these guys in this room can see the frame counters on the MDMs incrementing, they can look at the tractor of the vehicle, they can look at all the data that the ISS is capable of generating. What you also get in that system is pretty, big, pretty pictures coming down from the vehicle. Then it goes the other way as well. If one of these guys wants to change something on ISS, they'll send a command. That command will go from here out to one of those ground sites, go up to that TDR satellite, go to the ISS, and the ISS will respond to that. Um, the big yellow circles that you see up over Russia there are Russian ground sites that function just like the SpaceX ground site. The ISS in nominal in a nominal config uses the TDRS network to communicate with the vehicle, but we also use the Russian ground sites whenever we have a problem or if the Russians need to get some specific data off of the vehicle, kind of a backup system to our TDRS network. The Russians obviously use our TDRS network when we're not over one of their ground sites. Let's see, what else can you see up there? You can see that the, the, lat, the lat long in the vehicle is displayed for you and the altitude in miles, 221 miles up. Beta on there, negative 10.5, that's the angle between the sun and the earth. Two views down at the bottom represent some arbitrary computer generated images, right? Those are not my views. The one on the left shows you what the ISS looks like if you were standing on the sun. And the one on the right shows you what the ISS would look like if you had a camera just off of the end of the truss looking back at the vehicle. Those are updated in real time. Just kind of gives you some situational awareness. <coughs> of what's going on as far as the solar rays and the attitude of the vehicle. Let's see, clocks, a bunch of clocks up on the board. I'm always surprised when the clocks are having issues how much I depend on looking at them. The, uh, the one on the very left on the top, the 33 Soyuz mission elapsed time tells you that the vehicle that these three crew members came up on has been on orbit 90 days and some change crew usually stays on orbit for about six months when they come home and the limiting factor there is the Soyuz vehicle it's only certified for six months and then it needs to come back we're going to do a thing here in the next couple of years with uh, 
a Russian crew member and an American crew member who are going to go up on a Soyuz and then not bring that Soyuz back home and actually do two increments on orbit and stay up for a year. That would be Scott Kelly, who's a, the American astronaut who's been up there and kind of people. Uh, the Dragon MET, so our little Dragon vehicle came up, it's mission lap time, it's been up there for 19 days, and as I said, we're going to get rid of that on Monday and send it back home. It'll land in the ocean off of California and bring back all kinds of science research that we're ready to get back and various other pieces of hardware that we're ready waiting to get back. Uh, <clears throat> the, it is an international program. You've got control centers here in Houston. You have one in Huntsville, Alabama. You have one in Munich, Germany. There's a control center in Moscow. And there's one in the little town of Scuba, which is just north of Tokyo in Japan. There's also a small control center in St. Hubert, which is just outside of Montreal. And then you got the crew going around the world every 90 minutes. So we kind of have to have a, an agreed to time that everybody uses. So we just agreed to use Greenwich Mean Time. So all of the control centers use Greenwich Mean Time and all of the, uh, and the crew uses Greenwich Mean Time. So that's the clock up on the board there. So Greenwich Mean Time, day 78 at three in the afternoon. Uh, some of the other clocks you can see, various conferences. We have a private medical conference coming up for one of the crew members. The commander is going to have a tag up with some folks to talk about how he packs the dragon and so forth. On the right hand side, is some of the folks in here earlier were asking me what the crew sleep clock is. So the crew is supposed to go to bed in five hours and 36 minutes. We keep track of that stuff. We keep track of everything the crew does, right? You know, keep track of everything the crew does. And, uh, and just having the clock up on the board that reminds you that you've only got five and a half hours if you want to talk to the crew because we're not supposed to wake them up or we're not supposed to call them after they're supposed to be asleep. There's a daily planning conference coming up. And then the two clocks on the bottom there tell you that for the satellites that I talked about a moment ago, we're going to go loss of signal on the East 41 satellite in 44 minutes. And we're going to acquire signal on the West 171 satellite at 49. So we don't necessarily always have continuous comm with the ISS. And in fact, when other users are using the Tigra satellites and the crew's not doing anything or on the weekends when they're sleeping or at night, uh, we usually get to, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes, an hour where we're not in comm with the vehicle. The control team really appreciates those LOSs because it gives them the opportunity to get up and walk out and get a cup of coffee or go to the bathroom or heat up their lunch or whatever. Uh, let's see, on the right hand side there you can see a whiteboard with a bunch of numbers scrolling across it and a big happy go right in the middle. Uh, the go is related to the teeter's column. Whenever that says go, we actually have column with the vehicle. And then the two little green boxes underneath that tell us when we have voice communication with the vehicle, space to ground comm with the vehicle. When that turns red and says bad, that means we are not in comm with the vehicle, don't try to command it. This is live video. Yep. So that goes out in a good time. Say that one more time. That depends on the comm. It depends on the comm. Yep. Um, Let's see, so the, all the numbers up there represent commands that are being sent to the vehicle. You can see that the top command up there came from MCC Moscow, and it went to the F primary MDM and the FGB on the second box. The uh, second command down is a command that originated here. The terminate file transfer command came from here, and it went to the primary command and control computer on the vehicle and it was issued by the Cronus position who is the, I can't tell who that is, who is the young lady sitting over there in the corner. So she sent a command to the vehicle just a second ago to tell it to do something. And we get the positive feedback from the vehicle that the command actually arrived in it and is doing what it was supposed to. And then eventually she'll see that telemetry change on her display. The big happy white screen underneath there, we always like that to be happy and white because when it's not white, it has yellow and red stripes on it, which means something bad just happened on the vehicle. It's our caution warning display. So we get yellow stripes on there that are cautions, we get red stripes on there which are warnings, which are a little more critical, and we get red stripes on there which are emergencies, which are even more critical. So we always want it to be nice and white. It actually turned red last night with the crew, or actually during the crew's day on the previous shift where we had some small uh, 
call it smoke alarms that are enunciated in the FGB. That always gets everybody's attention when you get a smoke alarm pop up on the board. It turned out that actually one of the crew members was doing some housekeeping tasks near one of the smoke detectors and picked up a few particles of dust, which caused that FGB smoke detector to enunciate. Then the stuff on the bottom is just advisories. These are things that we want to pay attention to, but they don't necessarily need to get our absolute attention right now. And you can actually see there that the Equals flight controller sitting up here in front of uh, in front of flight the Ethos flight controller went back and re-enabled that uh, message for the FGB fire alarm because we set it off a couple times last night with dust in the FGB and we wanted to stop uh, perturbing the crew and we all agreed that it was just dust. We went ahead and inhibited that message. The Russians subsequently have done some work on that smoke detector from the ground, and now we went ahead and re-enabled it so that if there was an actual smoke event in the FGB, it would enunciate again. Um, talking about the flight controllers in here, so you have uh, Mr. Ron Spencer sitting here at the flight director's console. That's where I sit when I'm on console. Sitting next to him is uh, David St. Jock, who is a Canadian astronaut. Who is playing our role of Capcom today? And then you have a whole bunch of flight controllers scattered out around here who are working for Ron. So it's kind of a pyramid scheme in the flight control room with the flight director at the top. All of these people in here are subject matter experts on their individual systems, so they know how to do things like the environmental control officer, the ethos officer pays attention to things like smoke detectors and breathable air and making sure the cabin temperature 